Hello and welcome to this interview with author and podcaster Adam Croft. Adam has written over 20 psychological thrillers and crime books and he's sold more than 2 million copies worldwide over the last 10 years. He's also an expert in the art of independent publishing and is one of the biggest selling self-published authors. He is the co-host of the podcast series Partners in Crime and he has featured on BBC Television, Radio 4, The World Service, The Guardian, The Huffington Post and the list goes on. We are in for a very interesting talk. Um, I have a few bits of very small bits of housekeeping to do first of all, which is just to point out that this interview is part of the Wantage Literary Festival programme. I'm Valerie Rose and I'm one of the trustees of the festival and as you probably all know we had to make the very sad decision early this year not to have a festival this coming October. Um, it will be going ahead, fingers crossed, next year. Um, we're very sad about that but our festival director and the trustees were determined to offer our wonderful festival goers the opportunity of still getting to know and meet online if nothing else some of our wonderful British authors uh, who have been very busy this year. So this, all these events we have a whole series of interviews coming up uh, these events are all free to view but if you would like to make a donation you can very easily do this you just go to the festival website you press the donate button um, and you and you make a donation to the festival and we will be very pleased with that and you can also support this event by buying copies of Adam's books and these are available at independent booksellers and online. Um, I just wanted to well, I want to start off the interview by asking Adam about his brand new book What Lies Beneath and do you have a copy to hand that you can do you know what? I do. I am delighted <laughs> to hear that. Very professional. Thank I've, you very much. I've got, I've got hundreds knocking around here. Don't <laughs> worry about that. <laughs> uh, and I gather this was well. This book was only published last week, and mm. I gather you've been really busy over the last few weeks doing a launch tour. You seem to be doing events every day. You've just been telling me offline just how much interest there's been. That's great to hear. This is the first book in a new series. This is your new Rutland crime series. And I just yeah. wanted to know what inspired you to start a new series after your very successful Knight and Culver House books. Um, well, it's Rutland's an area I've been visiting for, for many years. Um, I, I got engaged in, in the area 10 years ago to my now wife, uh, my parents. Uh, subsequently moved to Rutland as well and I'm, I'm there I mean outside of global pandemics about once a week um, during book launches about three or four times <laughs> a week <laughs> uh, it's only about an hour away from me so it, it's somewhere I know quite well and I've found there's a very evocative place um, for for a crime series and I've had some ideas on my mind now for for a good couple of years and they became the first in in this series in the Rutland crime series which um, is, is the first book first series I've set in a real location so that was quite nerve-wracking I didn't want to upset anybody especially not in a, in a part <laughs> of the world that I, that I know and love um, and because it was the first one set in a real place I had all of these plans for a wonderful launch and you know we were going to have the boat out on Rutland water and and, and, do, and do all of this and but of course it's just not 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 possible we didn't know when it was going to be possible so we put the book out anyway and it's it's gone bananas to say the least I had um, one bookshop seller in Rutland one bookshop owner who on the day of the launch had said that based on pre-orders alone it was their biggest seller since a harry potter book 21 years ago um, by half past 10 in the morning on launch day they'd sold out and had to be restocked twice again that day we've uh, had five print runs done in the past week to keep up with demand some shops are being stocked every day every other day and it's just been absolutely phenomenal we've had lots of local retailers and gift shops post offices um, tourist information shop at, at Rutland Water all, all of these places have been selling the books and they've been flying off the shelves I think 
based on the the population of, of Rutland alone, which is only about thirty five thousand, um, I think we will probably have given the book to to everybody by by this time next week, based on the number that have been selling. So it's just been um, been remarkable, really. They've they've really taken it to heart. The local media and local press have have been very keen to cover it, and thankfully, people seem to have really liked the book as well. So fingers crossed, it it stays that way. It is lovely to hear about that enthusiasm, and um, as I said, I think you know perhaps the the idea of a Adam Croft literary walk or tour might be on the cards in future years, and um, would be. Yeah. I mean, it's lovely to hear that the tourist information place is taking it up and really embracing it. And obviously yeah, they, it. yeah, they're really pleased. They they gave me some feedback that it's been fantastic. The people have been coming from out of the area to to visit and to buy the book. Um, to get it from a local retailer because they've all got signed copies there as well and he said even little things like when they go to the the tourist boards um, at the end of the year to to talk about plans for next year and funding and things like that it it really helps them so it could Mm -hmm. genuinely help boost tourism and help boost um, business in the town and and, and in the county especially off the back of a a global pandemic when the shops haven't been open yep absolutely they've been really struggling and i know some shop owners have been telling me that they've had people coming in who've never been in the shop before and they've been buying lots of other stuff while they're there and it's really (laughs) boosted their sales i've had someone um one shop owner said to me that a man had come in begging for the book she only had one copy she'd had some kept aside for other people who were going to come in and who had who had had them set aside and he was practically on his knees begging her for for another copy so he can have one for his friend as well it's just it's been bizarre because for me a book launch is normally spent sitting here refreshing some some sales pages and and seeing how you know ebook orders and things are coming in so to have something that physical and to be out there and most of the time driving around myself trying to help keep these bookshops stocked up because there's a team of <laughs> only three others and um, and they're running around like headless chickens trying to trying to keep everybody in books and to be honest there's been a couple of days in the past week where we haven't had any and we've been waiting on another run from the printers and they've been working overtime as well so yeah just just mind-blowing really what a success story i hope it continues me too <laughs> <laughs> i'm very interested because you've got two other very established series that you you run um and so you, you're now coming in with this new rutland crime series which sounds fascinating and you've obviously had to set up and think about an event and mm. imagine and develop two new lead characters so i was wondering how do you set about how did you set about forming this mental image of di caroline hills who is the main protagonist in um uh, your new book yeah um i mean i uh, the idea i had for her um up front was that i wanted her to be quite a normal person with normal flaws and 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 not to be somebody who you know i didn't want to go down the the tropes of she's a, a raging alcoholic or a sexual <laughs> deviant or you know any big darkness there um she does have secrets in her past nothing that's um you know of, of the level that we see in in some perhaps slightly more cliched characters i wanted her to be very normal very relatable um and for me really the main character in the series is rutland itself and is the location and for me that that informs the style of the series um perhaps more than anything else my night and culver house books are quite um quite police procedural they're also um, they don't hold back in terms of you know the way characters talk and the things that they do it's, it's pretty gritty um my kemps and hardwick mysteries are very much the opposite they're uh, a tongue-in-cheek pastiche of the golden age so you see lots of the, the stock characters that you recognize from your Agatha Christie's and your Sherlock Holmes and things like that lots of deliberate tongue-in-cheek tropes um, chocolate box quintessential English town um, and for me the Rutland series sits in the middle of those so you've got the, the lovely setting and you've got the, the not closed communities but close communities mm-hmm. yeah. um, and and you've got the scenery and the setting but you've also got the crimes that that are happening there they they don't happen as much in the background as they do with the Kempston Hardwick books they are a bit more not gritty not gruesome at all um, but they're 
it, it follows more of the the police investigation and the the, the personal interpersonal dynamics that uh, that come into play there as well. That sounds really interesting. And am I right in thinking that the the next one in the new Rutland crime series is already knocking at the door fairly soon? It is very soon indeed. Yeah. Does that um, mean another launch party, <laughs> or is it just going to roll into one? Um, well, yeah, it, it does feel as if it is pretty much a kind of a hybrid launch of the, the two books, the way that people are already buying and pre-ordering the next one on borrowed time, the second one that's out on the 29th of September. And it does, it does feel as if people are, are kind of treating it as a, a hybrid thing and that they are <laughs> investing in the series. And, so, and carry on, sorry. Uh, sorry, I was going to say that I know a lot of um, people locally when the first book was announced and not long after that, the second one as well, um, had gone out and pre-ordered both books before they'd even read one, which I think was a, a remarkable um, leap of faith <laughs> on their part um, and a little bit of pressure for me. But thankfully, they, they seem to be enjoying it. The fact that they're only they're going to be published about, what, 12, 10 weeks apart, 12 weeks yeah. apart is... Yeah was that deliberate or did did you have delays with publishing what lies beneath or just everything went really well on on the next book i mean, I, mean I, I held what lies beneath back slightly i did want to have the first two out quite close together um so that i could make the most of of the buzz mm. while it was there which I, I hoped it would be there and it, it turns out it was i did I, I held it back possibly but i think by about a month or two not by a lot no, not a great deal um and yeah i thought well this the virus the pandemic isn't going away anytime soon <laughs> we're not going to have our big launch party out on the boat or anything like that so um we may as well get it out thankfully it, it turned out that the shops had all started opening a couple of weeks before as well so it was good timing for them just as the high streets were, were starting to, to swing back into action um and also again pandemic related a few people in the publishing industry have, have told me that september october to to Christmas is going to be an absolute bloodbath because of the <laughs> number of titles that are that are coming out that have been held back that are aiming for the, the Christmas slot in order to uh, to gain some some lost ground from when the bookshops mm. weren't open for for a very long time. So yeah, I wanted to perhaps try and avoid that. Thankfully, I've avoided. Um, I think it's the the third of September. I think they're slating, or the second of September. They're saying it's going to be. Um, a mad day i think something like publishing hell yes. yeah something like 300 major hardbacks being released that day <laughs> <laughs> it's just I mean, having both books out <laughs> with the two books out your two books out in quick succession really gives the reader a chance to get the series established and the characters yeah. established in their mind and they will then be really anxiously awaiting further developments and so yeah. when do you reckon the third will be out <laughs> Oh, that depends how long I need to sleep for after the second. <laughs> um, I, I would say, I mean, probably, almost certainly not before before Christmas. I'd say probably early next year. I'd aim for perhaps, but um, perhaps sit back a little bit and, and let everybody else fight over the the Christmas slots. I'll um, I'll I'll have a, a well earned rest after having not had a, a day off yet this year, <laughs> and, I'll, uh, and I'll, I'll, aim, I'll aim for for early next year. I think hopefully. Yeah, well done. Um, I've now got a rather sneaky question, which I hope you don't mind. And this is based on your book, Her Last Tomorrow, which I've just finished reading and mm. I've enjoyed. And the main protagonist, Nick, is a writer. Mm. And um, he, written in first person. And I was just interested to read, this is on page 21, if anybody wants to check. Um, he's talking and he's talking about his life and he says it seems ridiculous to say that with all that's going on but it's my writer's instinct to want to guess what people's personalities are the second i meet them <laughs> and i just wanted what do you feel about that is that is that you speaking you're the writer have, um, have you, are you really interested in people's personalities do you like to work them out and define them quite quickly I think so. Yeah, I think I do. Um, I mean, for, for a lot of people, it might not be page 21 or page 23. I think, that was a, I think you've got the first. That's my edition. Uh, yes, yeah, so you've got the early edition there. Mm -hmm. um, I did. Um, it was actually taken up by, by a publishing company not long after because of its success. And we reworked it. And in fact, it's um, the current edition is now 
almost twice the length and it's got chapters from the, the wife's point of view and lots of other stuff. oh yeah yeah so we've, um, i didn't realize that so i yeah. can now go and get another copy of that how would i know from the cover well the cover's different the cover's different between the two that was the the original cover that the book came out with um and it's a different cover that's kind of a bluey green um very different style but, but lots of lots of uh, re, uh, new prints would have a slightly different cover how would i know if i was in a bookshop and i wanted to read the expanded version and hear what natasha the wife feels hmm. does it flash up on anywhere on the cover expanded version or um uh, to be honest with you i think largely the the new version i think is probably I'd, I'd imagine most shops probably the only one that would, that would right, be there okay. now yeah, yeah. um but yeah it's it's one of those things sometimes publishers say you know we want to relaunch repackage rebrand this book and and i think it, i think it, it improved it greatly thankfully um but in terms of whether that's that's me speaking i, I think it is i think um as writers you don't want to have cardboard cut out characters but there are certain literary tropes which are mm -hmm. there for for very good reasons really so that people can can relate to characters more easily so that um i mean all characters are there because they serve a function in the story it's not they're not just there for background color mm -hmm. or for you know, to, to make up the numbers they, they should all serve a function and they all have i guess personality tropes that, that lead into those functions and i do I, I mean we all we all judge people fairly quickly it's um it's our brain's way of of saving us a lot of bother if we can jump to to quick conclusions and, and that's our on. flight or fight instinct, yeah. isn't it we've got to yeah. sum people up very quickly yeah, sometimes we, wrongly but yes it's mm, it's yeah, survival we, isn't it yeah if we can summarize and you know we're taking in trillions of bits of information every every second and if we can lower that to a to a few hundred by by ignoring certain things and, and jumping <laughs> conclusions and drawing shortcuts it it saves us all a lot of bother but um I, I think we all do i think we all do to a certain extent perhaps meet somebody and you make perhaps certain assumptions and a lot of the time they'll be wrong and i almost enjoy it more when they are wrong <laughs> i try to to work that into my characters as well so sometimes you'll perhaps see them as being a, a certain personality type but there might be a reason why that character wants the reader to see that personality type mm. and it might not actually be what's um what's hiding beneath the surface i nearly said what lies beneath be, exactly <laughs> <laughs> i think that's on the brain at present. thank you very, that was a really interesting comment um whenever i work at the, the literary festival one of the questions that always comes up is people want to know how authors write what's their writing regime because a lot of you know lots of people think they have a book at least one book if not a whole series of books in them but can't get them down and here you are you have done 22 novels psychological thrillers in slightly less than 10 years mm -hmm. how do you physically write are you a morning person are you an afternoon person do you set yourself a word uh, count I'm, I'm not allowed to have my cup of coffee or my drink of lager until <laughs> I, I've, I've completed so many words can you say something about that yeah well thankfully it doesn't go hand in hand with the lager because I tried to get my writing <laughs> on the first thing all right um, <laughs> mainly because I, I always I'm worrying about getting the words done otherwise and I'm, I'm feeling guilty about that so I think if I've got the, the words out of the way I've at least fulfilled the, the primary objective of my my day and my life and I, I try to aim for 2,000 words a day um, in terms of structuring the writing I'm I'm a, a quite a careful and assiduous planner but I give myself license to deviate from that so uh, the way that I always like to describe it is that for me writing a book and planning a book is a little bit like setting off on a long car journey you you know where you're starting you know where you're ending and you'll set the sat nav and it will tell you okay we're going to go up the the a1 the a606 and that's the route we're mm -hmm. going to take but if there's traffic along the way if there's an accident or if you come across roadworks you might take a diversion and go a slightly different way you'll still get to the same place um it might be a, a longer route it might be a shorter route it might be a more comfortable more scenic route um but you get there and and the sat nav will 
adjust itself along the way to to get you to your location and i think for me that's that's how i structure my writing i i do plan but i give myself license to to deviate from good that. analogy I think, yeah well I, I think the main thing is doing what works for you some people love to just and they write better if they just sit down in front of a blank page start chapter one and and go from there i would dearly love to be able to do that because i really don't like planning but <laughs> The, the, the thought just, just frightens the life out of me. And I think my productivity would take such a huge nosedive if I did it that way. So is 2,000 words setting concrete on a writing day? Um, At least 2,000 words. What yeah. happens if you get to 1,800 words and... Hmm. Oh, if I'm that close, then I, I am getting to 2,000. <laughs> and, uh, sometimes that takes me all day and I'm still here in the evening. And sometimes I might get it done in, in a little over an hour if I'm really yeah. going for it and things are just kind of pouring out of me. So it really does depend. Some, some days are harder than others, but the way I look at it is that this is my job and I'm very fortunate to be able to do it. And anybody else in any other job doesn't get to say, oh, I don't feel inspired today or I'm finding it hard today, so I'm, I'm not going to do my work. Nobody else gets that luxury. I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to do my job. And I think it would it would take the mickey a little bit if I just said, nah, it's not coming today. I won't <laughs> do it. Um, some days things do get in the way and, you know, you, you physically can't get it done, but I'll try and make that up then later in the week. So when I'm writing the, the software that I write in, I have my deadline date for my, to finish my draft. I tell it I'm going to do five days a week. It might not be Monday to Friday, but, you know, it, it, it depends. And I tell it my final word count and it, I work it out so that it's going to be about 2000 words a day. Some days I might do three, four, five. Some days I might not do any, but it, I would it's, make sure I hit that target. Yeah. And what about, I think one of the questions that often comes up is when do you allow yourself the luxury? And I put luxury in <laughs> quote marks here of revising do you reread what you read yesterday your first task as you go into your office on a brand new morning do you sit and reread what you wrote yesterday and tinker i i don't tinker i sometimes try to refresh myself because i will try to always leave it at a point where i'll be able to get straight back into it so sometimes i, I used to make the mistake of writing the bits that excited me and then i'd get to a bit where <laughs> i could tell it was going to be a bit of a, a harder push and i'll go i'll do that tomorrow and then tomorrow would come and i think i feel like doing it even less so i always try and push through those bits and leave myself at an exciting bit or a bit where i know how i'm going to write the next section so that when i sit down particularly because it's normally seven o'clock in the morning and i haven't had much coffee at that point <laughs> i'm um, i'm at least infused by what i'm about to write and i know where i'm going with it and it's it's normally a section that i can then get three, four hundred words in and then the wheels are turning and, and the cogs are moving and I can normally then push through the, the harder bits later on. I'm now going to show my age and say, because one of the questions again that comes up is, hmm, do you key in directly onto your laptop <laughs> or, or, or fountain pen or biro? But I am suspecting you're going to say direct to laptop. Yeah, mainly because it has to be typed in anyway. And I know. Oh, no, I don't think that that always follows, you know. <laughs> well, no, no. Someone, someone has to. It has to <laughs> enter a computer at some point to, to be printed. But I, um, yeah, for me, my, my brain moves quicker than my hands can sometimes. So I have to type and, and try and type fairly quickly. Plus, my handwriting is dreadful. But yeah, I, I, I do actually um, collect fountain pens and I've got about. <laughs> At, at the moment, I'm looking at a cabinet on the wall and I've got another a tray of them here. So, yeah, I, I am definitely a, a fountain pen fanatic. But that's normally for writing my notes and, and doing my edits. I, I print out the manuscripts each time and do a, a traditional proofreading yeah. edit with, 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 with your, your stats and, and what have you. Um, but, yeah, I, I like to, to jot things down, ideas and notes. And, and then, yeah, if I'm on a phone call, I'll take notes with a fountain pen. But otherwise writing straight. Is, is straight into the computer and what's the longest piece of text you have written and then inadvertently lost <laughs> wiped um, chapter two chapters couple of sentences 
inadvertently lost i i don't know because i i am quite i've, I've got a bit of a sort of an it background so i'm i'm quite yeah. um hot on making sure that things are saved straight into dropbox mm -hmm. and backed up and what have you but i have a couple of times had to deliberately delete quite large chunks i think actually um two books are released earlier this year they were that was the first time i've had to do it but i had to virtually rewrite the whole of of two books um one because it was a, a political thriller and real life events actually kept overtaking <laughs> what i was what i was writing and it, it, you're very it, prophetic are you unfortunately so yeah it, it's um it kind of read like um, a political diary after about two months <laughs> i had to get rewriting um once you know I, I thought well this is this is too ridiculous no one's going to believe this i'll write that and then three weeks later it's happened um and and the other one um just kind of fell apart a bit plot wise and and needed heavy rewriting and it's that sinking yeah feeling in the pit of your stomach mm -hmm. when you realize that actually this is only one small change but it affects about 45 chapters yes. very heavily so at which yeah. point yeah there are two effectively lost books out there so i think I'd, i'll have written something like i think on borrowed time will be my fourth book this year mm -hmm. but i've i've technically written six because i've written two of them <laughs> twice yeah well that's, that's still a pretty good hit rate isn't it I yeah think. Yeah, no wonder I'm tired. That, but <laughs> now, being locked in a house for four months did help with that productivity, I must admit. So, so you, you, lockdown has been pretty good for you in those terms? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, they said, don't leave your house, don't see other people, mm. um, spend time in the garden to get sunshine, mm. and um, they say that alcohol kills <laughs> viruses as well. So, I mean, it's, it's no real change in my life. Well, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the mantras I've been following for, for many years. Um, but yeah, of course, it's, it's been difficult, and especially not being able to get up to Rutland, um, because when I was writing that book, the first in the series, throughout that whole period, I couldn't go there, and I couldn't see the place, and I had to mm. either completely from memory or from ringing up my mum and dad and saying, can you just pop just down to Normanton? Just talk me through. <laughs> yeah, can you pop down to Normanton and see if there's a lock on this gate? And <laughs> it, was all a, it was all a little bit strange, but... Um, you know, yeah, I guess everybody was in, in the same boat. And fortunately, the people I did need to help me, the local people and the experts and, and what have you, were all sitting at home as well and perfectly free to answer my, my name. That's question. one of the great advantages. I, I'm keeping an eye, a close eye on the time here. One of the things I really want to ask you, and it's something I, don't, I know very little about, which is, well, I know you're an advocate of independent publishing. What does that mean? Why do you think it's such a good thing what are the what have been the advantages for you and what have been the disadvantages um well i mean i'm an advocate of whatever works for for each writer and believe me there are lots of days where i can very much see the the benefit and the appeal of just writing the book handing it over and not worrying about the business side of things but i think to publish independently you need to be business minded as well as creative minded you need to be able to switch the two on and off as and when required um that's quite a big switch it is it is yeah it's it, it's what a lot of people refer to as self-publishing which i i don't like as a term for two reasons one it's it's often used in in certain circles in a slightly derogatory way and also it's it's not true there's there's no self in it i essentially am the author and the director of the publishing company i i don't do it myself not by a long long stretch there's, there's a lot of people involved um i the cover designer i use has worked for all the big publishers he's designed covers for stephen king john le carre mm -hmm. um he's an editor who's worked with harper collins and it's it, it there's a a lot of people who are very very talented in, in doing what they do and rather than doing it myself rather than going to an all service company it's not like a, it's not a, a vanity publishing project at all it is getting the books straight out there and me essentially doing the job of what the publisher does so getting the books into the bookstores through traditional distribution chains through gardeners uh, you know, bertrams god rest their souls and um and and 
especially with everything being so digital now, it is it is much easier. Um, especially with ebooks, they can be up within an hour and live and available for people to buy. Paperbacks are much much um, simpler, much more streamlined now. I mean, yeah, this one here you wouldn't know wasn't a, a, a traditionally published um, paperback. It's you you wouldn't know the difference right. nowadays and a lot of you know i've been doing this for 10 years and a lot of the barriers were there you could tell an independently published book a mile off before you had you no could just chance. pick it up and you yeah. look at the quality you look at yeah the type and it's not quite right yeah. and yes but I now mean, no they're all produced in, in exactly the same factories and, and presses now but and how do you find the time? Because you're you're writing your two thousand <laughs> words, and mm. at the same time you have uh, cover design and contracts and worldwide contracts, and do I? Yeah, that's a lot of balls to keep in the air. Um, essentially, although I I direct the the publishing company, I I don't do all of those things so mm -hmm. you know I, I mainly focus on writing my wife does a lot of the, the back office stuff she effectively runs my office and works full-time with me um i have, have two other people who who work for me each day doing doing various bits and bobs and admin tasks and, and sorting out other bits and bobs that, that need doing uploading podcasts and, and and things like that because yeah, as you touched on earlier that's a that's a whole other mm. other arm to it so I, I try to focus on doing what i do best and the bits that nobody else can do like yeah the writing like the speaking to readers the press bits and bobs and interviews and i i, I try to find people who are who are better at doing the other things than i am so i get to retain that that creative control I get to say, well, I've got a book ready. Let's have it on sale next week rather than waiting a year or 18 months. Um, so it, it's got all those those benefits. But yeah, it, it's a, a lot of work. Um, so the disadvantages, to sum up, you think it's a lot of work and you need to find the right people. And obviously you've been really good at drilling down and finding the perfect people for your production team. Yeah, I mean, you can do it yourself. And, and, and I have done. Um, I mean, I've not designed my own covers and done my own editing and yeah. um, i think i've always been of the opinion that the product should be as good as it possibly can the book should be as good as it possibly can um because otherwise i think it's it's an insult to the readers and i think you need to have that that pride in your work but yeah it's still regardless it's still a, a huge amount of work it's it, it's quite a bit of pressure but it's pressure that i enjoy because i know that if things don't go right i've got nobody to blame but myself i don't want to be and I have been in a situation where you've you perhaps a book that you've had with a, a publisher hasn't been going quite as well. And you're in that awkward position where you're trying to say to them, you know, why didn't you do this? Why haven't we done that? Why, you know, trying to put some pressure on them. And, and that's that's not a nice situation to be in. I think putting that pressure on myself, I, I tend to get far better results. Mm. You obviously have a very well honed machine now. You know what you're doing would you recommend anybody coming into it and having written their first book to go down the independent publishing line or what what, what help what support could you suggest where would they turn to because you've made a very strong case for it yeah well i think if it suits them and if they are entrepreneurial and and perhaps business minded as well and, and are quite happy to, to take on that side of things then it, it's a wonderful journey and a, and a fantastic experience and i still love every minute of it um otherwise you know if it's something that doesn't appeal to you and you want to go down the agent and the, and the publisher route then absolutely do i'm i'm certainly not averse to that at all um but i think yeah if, if it is something that, that does appeal i've uh, for the last couple of years now i've i've run the indie author mindset project which is about essentially trying to help authors navigate the um quagmire of publishing there's, there's so much yep. advice out there some of it good some of it bad and i think for me the focus is always on long-term organic growth in your career i think a lot of people see these overnight sensations and they want to know what the next big thing is in terms of advertising and marketing but i think for me it's a case of building a strong sustainable career for many years to come and building a strong sustainable industry for years to come for for authors and for readers there are lots of things happening in publishing at the moment which i think are are not sustainable and could cause us all some problems in in years to come and that they're things that i try and advise against and try to 
try to rally against really and and, um, and your website was called your was called your indie it's indie author mindset yeah there's um there's an indie so author mindset yep there's a facebook group which i think has got about two thousand authors in it now and you know there's people from right at, at the start of their journey who have not even written a word yet and they're thinking about it up to people who have sold five ten million books in there and they're all sharing advice and giving each other lots of uh, help and motivation. It's a, it's a wonderful community, the Indie Author Mindset. There's an Indie Author Mindset podcast as well, which I put out um, once a week. It's 15 Once minutes. a week. How, uh, how many hours do you have in your day? <laughs> yeah, but this is the thing, yeah. But fortunately, that only takes 15 minutes, and it's done pretty much off the cuff. Um, I try to keep it short and sweet and succinct, and um, I'm very lucky that I then do that. I hit the stop button and that then goes over to to somebody else who does the um the packaging and the putting together and the uploading i've also got the partners in crime podcast which i present with um a friend of mine robert Dawes, who's um, a crime writer and um some people might recognize him off off the telly as well he's um he lives a couple hundred yards up the road from me right i hadn't so, realized that <laughs> yeah so we, we get together each week in in my garden at the moment we um we put a, a marquee up in the garden each week to and lug all of the studio gear outside to record that because of uh because of social distancing now um, excuse, i've got to show my age again very quickly because we're running out of time mm. just tell me a little bit about your podcast partners in crime yeah, I mean, for, for people what's he going to tell me? Um, well, for people who who perhaps don't know what a podcast is, it's essentially a podcast is to radio what the iPlayer or YouTube is to TV. Um, so it, it it's audio on demand, normally speech based, not music. Um, Partners in Crime is, is is based around the concept that we are both crime writers, and we do try to review crime books we've been reading, crime TV shows we've been watching perhaps cover some of the major awards and things that have been going on, things that big crime writers have been saying and doing. But we, we hardly ever get round to that, to be honest with you. We, we, we tend, to, <laughs> tend to mess about a little bit. And um, it, it's quite, I, I guess, witty and irreverent. We don't take it or ourselves seriously. And how often does the podcast come out? That's once a week as well. We, um, yeah, it, it's normally about, the show's about half an hour. And then we record about another 20 minutes half an hour for our our patreon subscribers who do an extra show so yeah it's it's a lot of recording um it's probably about an hour and a half's worth of recording each week we do on across the two podcasts um and then of course there's editing and, and production after that but thankfully i i don't get involved in that now adam can i just say thank you very much it has been brilliant talking to you I've learned a huge amount. You have been a very upbeat, inspirational author. And I'm now going to switch off the recording in a minute and go and start looking at podcasts <laughs> because you have inspired me. Well, thank so, you. If I, if I can be upbeat after the, the week or two I've had at <laughs> eight o'clock in the evening on the Wednesday, I'm, I'm very happy. <laughs> well, it has been a joy to interview you. And can I just remind listeners that your books are available in all independent uh, bookshops and online and I should suggest that people also go online and look at your, your website which I found really fascinating and if anybody would like to donate to the Wantage to Three Festival reach for that website and that donate button sorry it sounds terribly American I do apologize for that bit <laughs> thank you very much again okay, good night thank you. bye